able to imagine what it's going to be like in heaven when the billions of saints of God, those that have gone on, those to go, including myself, you know, I'm going to be able to sing. I am going to be able to sing up there. I'm telling you, I am going to be able to sing. To stand in the presence of the Almighty God, there is nothing that you won't be able to do. So we might as well practice well down here and shout hallelujah to our King. Join with all the heavens and shout hallelujah to our King. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you richly. You may be seated. Praise the name of Jesus. God is in this house. As he always is, he is here visiting with us. As a matter of fact, I don't think he's visiting. He takes up residence in this place. Praise the name of Jesus. How many of you are here for the very first time on a Sunday morning? Just wave your hand right where you are. Yes, we do have a couple on this side. One on this side, two on this side. And in the balcony? Okay, well, we have quite a few people. I think I uh, estimate about six or seven. So why don't you stand so that we can extend a hand of welcome to you, that you know that we are glad to have you with us. Come on, we don't want to put you on the spot. Oh, there we go. What seems like a whole family on that side. Praise the name of Jesus. God bless you richly. Thank you so for coming and visiting with us. We hope you enjoy worshiping the Lord with us. And saints of God, you know, it's always good to be in the house of God. That's what David says, you know. He was glad. Were you gl are you glad this morning that you are in the house of God? Oh, there is no better place to be. There's one other place to be. But we're not ready to get there yet. Okay? And that's heaven. We can have heaven right here upon earth. If you have the Spirit of God within you, you're walking in alignment with the Word of God and the Spirit of God, man, heaven is right here upon earth, especially if you have an angel by your side, <laughs> such as I do. Our sister Jennifer is going to be ministering to us this morning, so put your hands together and welcome her. Should I comment? <laughs> he always has me blushing, so I don't even know what to do with myself. <laughs> we sing a song in this church, and the words go like this. Your word is life, the richest of delights, and food for my soul and food for our souls. Father God, we thank you so much for your word this morning that brings life, that brings sustenance, that brings clarity, that brings your voice to the earth. And we thank you so much this morning that you have ordained houses like this all over this world where you can reveal yourself and the truths of your kingdom to your people, where we can have communion with you and sup with you and have fellowship with you as we worship, as we experience your touch upon our lives. And so we welcome your presence in our midst. We know that you are here, but we just want to acknowledge you once again. And we just pray that you will speak to us by your spirit. For you have a purpose to accomplish in all things in the assembly of the saints. And so we pray that you will give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to this church 
and your church across this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of John, St. John's Gospel, chapter 12. John's Gospel, chapter 12, and we're going to be reading from verse 20. It says, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. <clears throat> Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came their voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said, that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. But and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. <clears throat> now the beauty of the word of God is that it is re as relevant today as it was when Jesus walked the face of the earth. And this passage of scripture is no exception. In this text we see an account of some Greeks coming to Philip and requesting to see Jesus. And the Bible tells us that Philip went to Andrew, and they both went to Jesus, informing him of this request. Now, Jesus made a very profound statement in response to that. And he said in verse 23, that the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now this statement he made regarding his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He was speaking about the time when he will face the cross, be crucified, suffer death, be buried, and rose again. And it had also a direct bearing on the Greeks and on their request to see Jesus. You see, up until that time in history, salvation belonged to the Jews only. But when the Son of Man, referring to himself, is glorified, this is what he was saying in this response, all men would see Jesus, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles only, also, and also the Greeks, which were Gentiles. 
Now the beauty of the word of God is that it can re relate to things both in the past, the present, and in the future all at the same time. Jesus was then speaking in response to the, to the Greeks requesting that they see him when they said we would see Jesus. But he is also now speaking to this church. And he's also speaking to the church of Jesus Christ at large. And he's saying to all of us that the hour is come that the Son of Man, for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now whenever the term, the hour is come, is used in scripture, it speaks about an event or a season that is soon upon us it is soon to come it is not a literal hour according to the measure of time like 2 p.m or 5 p.m okay we're talking spiritual talk here this morning but it suggests a season that we are about to come into in the very near future future and the fact that it is compounded with the words is come the hour is come suggests that the hour is sooner than we think. Now this differs when the words the day is used in scripture, as in the case of the day of trouble is near, or the day of the Lord cometh. This terminology is also used to suggest a period of time that is to come. It is also used to suggest a period of time, but usually is referring to a number of years. And these years can extend up to 5, 10, 20, 60, 70 years. It all depends on God and his timing. And similarly, when the term time is used, as in the case of First Peter, for the time is come that judgment must first begin in the house of the Lord. This speaks about a season that is forthcoming, that is closer than a day, referred to in scripture, and it's longer than an hour. So there are different terminologies used in scripture, and we just need to understand that when the Bible says a day, it doesn't mean today. It doesn't mean tomorrow. When he talks about the time is near, the Lord is not talking about a literal time or literal hour. It's all prophetically speaking, figuratively speaking. And all of these time frames, frames are in the calendar of God and we find them throughout scripture. Okay? In some cases, a number, specified number of years or days is referred to which are literal. Like when the children of Israel were in bondage for 70 years. That was predicted and prophesied before. And therefore, when Daniel and different prophets came up afterwards, they were able to trace back and actually time the fulfillment of that said prophecy. So there are times in Scripture when a, spe a specified number is given which are literal. And in other cases, and an, ex an exact time or period is not given. It just speaks about a season that is forthcoming. And so when the Lord is saying to us this morning in this church that the hour is come for the Son of Man to be glorified, He is speaking about a season that is soon to come upon the body of Christ. Amen? He is declaring that a season is coming to His church in the very near future, something that is very close in the calendar of God. And as a result of that, He wants to bring our lives into alignment with his purpose and he wants to deal with the body of Christ at large to bring the corporate church into that alignment. Now these Greeks that we spoke about <laughs> are very significant and they were considered by the Jews as Gentiles. Anyone who was not a Jew was considered a Gentile by the Jewish people, by the children of Israel. And there was something very special about these Greeks. The Bible said that they came to worship at the feast and they desired to see Jesus. Now these are Gentile people that we are speaking about that came to Jerusalem 
at the time of the feast, I presume it was the Passover, to worship together with the Jews. So that tells us this morning that these Greeks were God-fearing Greeks. They were God-fearing Gentiles. They were not of the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers, but yet they had a consciousness towards the God of the Jewish people. And I'm sure that being around the Jews for a number of years, because the Bible says they dwelt among them, I'm sure that they heard a lot about Jesus when he walked the face of the earth in their time. They heard a lot about his teachings. They heard a lot about his miracles and all the good works that he had done. But obviously, that was not enough. They came and they desired to see him. It was not good enough for them, to, for them to hear about this Jesus that everyone was talking about. They desired to see him. And so the Bible says they came to Philip. They didn't go to the high priest. They didn't go to the Pharisees, who were the religious rulers of the day. They didn't go to the Sadducees. The Bible says they came to Philip, who was a disciple of Jesus. And what is even more interesting is the fact that they did not come desiring to see a miracle. They didn't come to see a sign or a wonder because they heard all, of, all about the good things that Jesus had done. They didn't come to see all of these things. All they wanted to see was Jesus. Unlike many in Christendom today. Many who follow after things, who follow after the spectacular, who follow after signs, wonders, and miracles. And what happens in the, in the end result is that they end up victims to crooks. You know, we have crooks in the kingdom whose only ambition is to market the things of God and to milk God's people. But that is not the message this morning. These Greeks wanted to see Jesus. And the world wants to see Jesus. The Gentiles represent the world today. And you see, brothers and sisters, there are many in this world today that are seeking and they are looking to find Jesus. They want to see Jesus. Some may not realize it. Many may not realize what they're looking for. Some might even deny it, but the reality is in the heart of all men is the quest for peace, is the quest for hope, is the quest for love, and is the quest for truth. And inherent in the heart of man, people are looking, people are searching. Men and women all across this world, they're looking for these four basic things, hope, love, peace and truth and we all know that Jesus is the embodiment of all of these things he embodies all of these things and that is why I said that sometimes they're searching for things but they don't realize what they're searching for they don't realize that it is Jesus that they need for our Lord he is the prince of peace he is the hope of our salvation he is love he is the way the truth and the life he is the living water that satisfies every soul, the emptiness of man's soul. But because of the blindness of men's hearts and because of Satan's deceptions, men are searching. And when I say men, we're talking about mankind. Okay? Men are searching for all sorts of things, for all of these things, I should say, in religion, in drugs, in alcohol, in sex, in people, men who are searching, they're looking for hope and love and peace in all of these things. They're, too, they're thinking that they could find Jesus in religion. That they can get peace from their troubles using drugs, alcohol. That they can get the satisfaction of their souls um, with sexual partners and just finding a companion. But true peace and love and joy and satisfaction is found in only one person. In only one person. And the Bible says his name is Jesus. And this is where you and I come in this morning. This is where we come in. And this is where 
the role and purpose of the church of Jesus Christ in the earth today is found. And that is to reveal Jesus to a lost and to a dying world. To reveal Jesus to those who are hurting, to those who are deceived, to those who are bound, and to those who are blinded. You know, many times as children of God, we are so caught up concerning our purpose on this earth. And, it's, and we always wonder, but what is our purpose? What is our purpose here? And we often link our, link our purpose to doing some kind of church work or doing something for God. We link our purpose with works and with doing. Well, our purpose here on earth is not just linked to works of service. Anybody could do good works. In fact, there are many very conscientious religious folk who are involved in all sorts of good works and charities to help people who are in need. And the church world today is full of people who are working for God. There are people on platforms who, who have been called to platform ministry, preaching or singing or playing instruments. Others are involved in works of service, ushering, cleaning, and all kinds of goodwill ministries. And all of these things are good and they are needful in the body of Christ. But my question to all of us this morning is, is Jesus seen? Is Jesus seen through our lives? In all that we do, is he manifested through us? Through our attitudes? Through our behavior? Is he seen as we deal with one another? You see, brothers and sisters, we can be involved in a lot of things. Just like the unsaved religious folk. And we could be involved in all sorts of works of service. But to many, both in the kingdom and outside of the kingdom, we can be a turn off. And what is portrayed in Christendom today, most times, is not Christ. What is portrayed, what is revealed, is not Christ. And I make no apologies for saying so. When we look at what is happening in Christendom today, what do, what do we see? Do we see Jesus? When I see what's happening in the church world today, what we see is a lot of self, a lot of pride, a lot of corruption and contamination of the holy things of God. And instead of people being drawn to Christ, they are being turned off by all that is going on in the church world today. When we put on the television, when we listen to the radio, when we look at things on the internet, we are seeing that the truth of God's word is being mingled with so much of man's ego and so much twisting of the scriptures for personal gain that the power of the word is being diminished in the lives of God's people. The power of the word is being diminished in the lives of people. Why? Because it's being mixed with all sorts of things. With man's ego and pride and it's being twisted and corrupted. All for personal gain. It is not being preached in its purest form. When we look at what's happening in Christendom today, we are seeing that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are being marketed for money. Fornication, adultery, homosexuality, pornography is rampant in the church. But we're working for God, eh? We're working for God. Marriages are breaking down. Where is Christ in all of this? Where is Christ in all of this? Is he seen? But we're linking our relationship with our works, our purpose here with our works of service. But through our attitudes, our behaviors, the way we conduct our lives here on earth, Jesus is not seen. And we wonder why people are being turned off every day 
and want nothing to do with Christianity. We wonder why. It's a sad day in the church world today. And I am as, a, as affected by what is going on as some of you may be, those of you who may. <laughs> but the Lord is saying something to his church this morning. He's saying something to you. He's saying something to me. He's saying to, to the church of Jesus Christ worldwide that the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. That the hour is come, that the hour is at hand, that it's upon, it's upon us, that Jesus be glorified. Now, how will Jesus be glorified? How is Jesus glorified? He will be glorified through those of us who are willing to allow him to shine through us. In spite of what is going on around us, in spite of what the church, in quotations, is portraying. God has reserved a people in these last days who are willing to stand for what is right and to do what is right. God's purpose will be accomplished in the earth one way or the other. And he has a remnant of people in the earth today. They may be small in comparison to the multitudes who profess Christ. And these people will be willing to stand for what is right and to do what is right. A people who are hungry for the truth. A people who are intolerant of gimmicks and scams and immorality and compromise. And a people who want to see God's glory revealed and Jesus represented in the right way. This is so lacking. So lacking in the church today. We are not responsible, brothers and sisters, for what's happening all around us. We're not responsible. God is not going to hold us accountable for what the other person is doing. But we are responsible for our own selves. And for the lives we live. And for how we behave. And so God wants to bring our lives into alignment. He's going to be dealing with us as individuals. This entire world is in darkness. And there are many who are on their way to a lost eternity. The Lord wants us to be conscious this morning. Of the fact that there are people that cross our paths every single day. Many walk by our desk at the office every day. Some are living right in our homes. They are unsaved family members. Unsaved relatives, spouses, parents. Some of our children, sisters and brothers are not saved. The question is, are they seeing Jesus in us? We could blame the world for many things. But we have to take responsibility for our own selves. Are they seeing Jesus in us? Are they seeing Jesus in our conduct? In our behavior? In the way that we speak to one another? In our lifestyle, the standards that we keep in our home? Our primary purpose here on earth, brothers and sisters, is that we be conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Our primary purpose. This tells me that our purpose goes beyond externals and it goes beyond good works. And it involves dying to self daily in order for Christ to be seen through us. People know that we are saved. People know that we go to holiness revival. People know that we do this in the church and that in the church. But they want to see more. They want to see Jesus in us. Jesus said it this way in verse 24 of our text. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except 
a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Jesus used this analogy, the analogy of a seed, in order to convey a truth that we have to die in order to live. We have to die to self in order as well for Jesus to be seen. And he was speaking in the context of this verse concerning his own life. How he laid down his life. And as a result of his willingness to surrender his will to the will of the Father. Many people, not just the Greeks, but many people will come to know him as Savior and Lord. He was speaking here about dying to our own selfish desires, to our corrupt nature. He was not talking about dying physically, like we have to put a knife through our heart and die. <laughs> he was talking about concerning our selfish ways, our selfish desires, our corrupt nature. Those are the things that we have to put to death. John the Baptist said it this way. He says, he, meaning Jesus, must increase. And I must decrease. So Jesus set the example. He set the example for us. He submitted his will to the will of the Father. He went to the cross. He allowed a wicked man to crucify him. He died. And on the third day, he rose again. The Bible says, with all power and with all authority being given to him. And now, Jesus is able to touch and to reach millions of more people today than he ever did when he walked the face of the earth. All because he's not limited to human body. And he has divested himself in you, and he has divested himself in me. And all those, and in all those who would embrace him as Savior and Lord, and through those of us who would allow him to shine, he is able to touch and to heal and to change many lives. So he set the stage for us using his own life and going to the cross and dying that he will live again. Now one of the most challenging times, sorry, one of the most challenging things for a Christian to do is to deny and crucify the flesh. One of the most challenging things for us to do as believers is to deny and crucify the flesh. It's much easier for us to give some money to the poor. It's much easier to just put some money in an envelope and put it in the offering than to exercise self-control over our thoughts, our emotions, our tongues. Amen? Amen. But everything that God requires of us, he empowers us to do. Everything that God requires of us, he empowers us to do. And so there is no excuse like, I can't. And we're talking here about the formula for Jesus to be revealed. We must die. We must decrease. The self in us must die in order for Christ to be seen. And so all of us as born again believers, those of us who are, we all have been given the enabling power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God to crucify the flesh and to behave in the right way so that Jesus could be seen. We have all been given that power. But it's all dependent on the choices that we make and the desires that we have to really please the Lord that will cause us to either yield or respond or just live our lives unto ourselves. The Bible says that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy, love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. And when we look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit, we see a manifestation of the nature and character of Jesus himself. 
when we examine the fruit of the Holy Spirit, we see a manifestation of Jesus, the character and nature of Jesus Christ. Jesus embodies all of these qualities. He is love. He is joy. He is the Prince of Peace. He is long-suffering. He is gentle, good, faithful, meek. The world wants to see Jesus. <laughs> he wants to see the fruit of his character revealed through our lives. And he is revealed through these attributes through these attributes. It's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so all of these virtues, brothers and sisters, need to be developed in us. They need to be cultivated so that Jesus can be re revealed. And as a result, a crucifixion has to take place because these, this fruit will not be manifest unless there's a crucifixion of the works of the flesh. We must die to our self-nature in order for Jesus to be seen, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Are you seeing the link here this morning? We are commanded in Colossians, and these things are not new, but just the Lord wants to re-emphasize the basic truths of Christianity because we have strayed so far from these basics, and many of us are not living and not exercising ourselves in these basic things. Colossians 3 tells us that we should put to death these things. Fornication. Is fornication rampant in the church today? Yes. We want Jesus to be seen, but we're fornicating down the road. We're committing immorality. We have partners and behind closed doors. Born again believers are indulging in fornication. Uncleanness, anything that's unclean, anything sexually that's unclean, inordinate affection, we need to put to death these things, evil desires, greed, anger, wrath, malice, filthy communication out of your mouth, lying. You know, these things are like weeds. They're like thorns and thistles in our lives that choke the life of God from within us. If we practice these things, if we indulge in them, we would not experience the manifestation of Jesus coming forth from our lives. He wouldn't be seen. And as a result, many will consider us hypocrites and a turn off in the kingdom of God. We said before, we are not responsible for what the other person does. We're not responsible for the world. You know, we can make broad statements of what's happening out there, but we need to bring it home. Are we indulging in these things? Are we practicing these things? You see, brothers and sisters, it is either Christ that is reigning in our lives or self reigns. It is either Christ that is seen or self that is seen. We can spend a lot of time, as I said, speaking about what's going on in the church world and we make excuses and we figure because everybody is doing it, we can get away with it. The Lord wants to bring our lives into alignment this morning and he wants us to address some of these issues in our lives. We all may have different struggles, different areas that are reigning, works of the flesh that are reigning. All of us are different. We all have different struggles. We need to address the issues in our lives. Like the anger that we display when we are offended. We will get angry. We will feel the battle <laughs> Raging on the inside when something irritates us. We need to address that. We need to exercise ourselves, put it to death, cause it not to manifest, not to 
harm other people as a result by the things that we do or say. We need to address the way that we speak to people, the way we behave when we can't have our way. This is where the true test of self-control and the fruit of the Spirit is manifested. When we are in situations and things are not going our way or we want our way in a particular setting, what and how do we behave in a setting like that? We need to address our body language that we express when we feel a certain way about something. And somebody else doesn't agree with us. We give off vibes according to us trainees. There's a spirit that's released. Why? We're not saying anything but we oozing. It's called body language. Mm -hmm. What about our behavior? And our attitude when somebody wrongs us. You know, we can do the right thing and have a wrong attitude. You could go and say, you know, I was offended. But it's the way we say in this is like if we have to deal with issues within us as well. All of these things, brothers and sisters, are real and practical scenarios that we face on a regular basis. And many of us don't realize that when we behave in such ways in our homes in our working environment, or wherever we may be, all we are doing is feeding the flesh instead of crucifying it. When we give way to these negative emotions and bad ways and feelings, all we are doing is feeding the flesh. The Bible says that we need to crucify it, mortify the deeds of the flesh. And because we're not dealing with the issues, Christ is not seen. The fruit of Jesus is not born. The fruit of his character, the fruit of his nature is not seen. It's not born in our lives. And as a result, he's not glorified. The world is looking at us, church. He's looking at us. The world is looking at us. They're looking at us. And they want to see Jesus. There's so much things that are going on out, out there, but people are searching. They are hungry for the truth. They are hungry for something that is real, for something that is genuine. And they want to see Jesus. Not us. They want to see Jesus. My question to us this morning is what are they seeing? What are, what are our neighbors seeing? People living right next door to us. What are they hearing coming from our kitchen window? <laughs> Fighting? Quarreling? <laughs> Not politics. <laughs> Fighting? Quarreling? Christian wives speaking any old how to their husbands? Christian husbands... Speaking any old how to their Christian wives, but we go into church and dress up nice on a Sunday morning. Eh? Our teenage children doing or allowed to do all sorts of things that bring our Christian home into disrepute. What are our neighbors seeing? You know, we could think about the world and figure it's Indian Africa. What about the neighbors? They're part of the world. They're part of the, uh, our unsaved environment. What are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are our employers or employees seeing? Coming from us as Christian employees. What are they seeing? A laziness? Disloyalty? A confusion maker. What are they seeing when they see us? Remember, we represent, we're supposed to be representing Christ. When we are on the workplace, what are our employers and the people around us, our co-workers, what are they seeing? A confusion maker? A gossip? A, a Christian who has no respect for their supervisor or for their boss? 
What are people seeing when they look at us? A person with no business ethics? A person with no moral standards? We dress in anyhow. The world is a style now. Half of our bosoms have to be outside because it's the style. Necklines grow lower. What are they seeing when they look at us? A person with no moral standards? An adulterer? A fornicator? Someone who's flirting with everybody in the office? A liar? A thief? A person who just is out of control, who just does and says whatever comes to their mind? What are people seeing when they look at us? It's time, church, for us to understand that God's plan and purpose for our lives goes far beyond our little world. It goes far beyond our little world. Our little world that revolves around me, myself, and I. And it's time for us to lay aside childish things and selfish desires. It's time for us to do the basics of Christianity. You know, if we just apply Colossians 3 to our lives, meditate, study it, exercise ourselves in it, we will grow faster than we think. And the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of Jesus, of his character will, be, will begin to shine through us. And even though many of us have been saved for many years, they will wonder, what happened to you recently? But the revelation has been now starting to apply the word. We're now starting to apply it to our lives. It's not no big revelation. It's something that we hear every baptism class. Every Sunday that we have water baptism. And ever so often as the ministers in this church preach. But are we doing it? Are we doing the word? Are we doing it? We need to align ourselves, brothers and sisters, for the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. God wants to do something in the earth today. He wants to do something. He wants to move by His Spirit. He wants to draw people into His kingdom. But it's only as He's revealed it through us. He's not going to just show up in person. He's going to use you and me. He has divested Himself in us. And he's looking to us to submit to his purpose and to allow him to come to shine through us. Amen? Amen? So it's time for us to align ourselves with the eternal purposes of God. For it's the key to us enjoying a fruitful and fulfilling life with God's favor and God's backing upon us. So many times we put the cart before the horse and... Many in Christendom, I even heard up to this morning on the radio, people only talk about money, 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 money. On TV, sorry. <laughs> money, 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 money. But as we align ourselves, seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, all things, the backing of God, the blessing of God, the favor of God will be added. Jesus said in verse 25, He that loveth his life, speaking here about the self-life, shall lose it. You shall lose all that you will set out again. But he that hated this life, his life in this world, shall keep it or shall gain life eternal. What is life eternal? Eternal life speaks about a quality of life enjoyed both here on earth and in the life hereafter. It's a life full of God's favor and blessings, which brings with it prosperity of soul and also prosperity in material things. This does not mean for one moment that we will never suffer hardship, any kind of hardship or trials. For the Bible says that in this world, we're going to have tribulation, but what this scripture does mean, what, is it, what, what, it, what it tells us is that in the midst of every negative situation, God's provision, his protection, his presence will be with us. But we have to hate our self-life. That's the context. We have to hate the self-life. We have to mortify it. We have to put it to death. 
that, the, that, we, that we will inherit life eternal. Amen? No money, brothers and sisters, can buy these things. Can buy God's provision. We can't pay money to God and say, okay, Lord, you'll, you'll provide for me. Eh? Or you'll protect me. We can't, Jesus can't be bought with money. They are all inherited blessings from God as a result of our obedience to him. Amen? And Jesus goes on to say, if any man will serve me, let him follow me. If any man serve me, let him follow me. It's not a matter of just saying, I, you know, I follow in Jesus. We are to follow the example that Jesus set down for us so that he could shine through us. We are to follow his example, his way of handling matters. His way of handling matters, his teachings, his humility, his love and compassion for humanity. These are the things that we need to emulate. His love for his father, his passion for prayer, his lack of compromise, his stand for righteousness, his surrender to the father's will. If any man serve me, Jesus said, let him Follow me. We have to follow these things. He set the example for us to walk in. His surrender to the Father's will. What is the Father's will? That we be conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. You see, brothers and sisters, it's not just a matter of professing Christianity. A professing Christian will not impact any lost soul. They have, lot of, they, have, they have a lot of false religions, religious people around, people who are involved in false religious beliefs, under the category of Christian, and their lives have nothing to show for it. So it's not a matter of just professing Christianity. It's not just a matter of coming to church. It's about living the life and being conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus. That is our ultimate purpose here on earth. And Jesus concludes by saying, if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Him will my father honor. The always come, brothers and sisters, as I said before, and I will continue to declare, for the Son of Man to be glorified. In the world today, in the world all around us, there is darkness all around, and sin is rampant. The knowledge of good and evil, as revealed in the Word of God, is being tainted. Listen to me carefully, carefully. The knowledge of good and evil as revealed in the word of God, not according to man's opinions, is being tainted by evil men and by politicians who are being influenced by the spirit of antichrist which is unleashed upon the earth today. And what we are seeing a lot of is that evil is being called good and good is being called evil. The only hope for this world, brothers and sisters, is Jesus. Amen. The only hope. But how can he be seen and how can he be known unless we reveal who he is? How can he be seen and how can he be known unless he be revealed through our lives? If we behave just like the world, we will be of no effect to the kingdom of God. If we are part of the world, if we behave just like the world, we are of no effect to the kingdom of God because we're just blending in with all the sin that is, and corruption that is taking place in the world. The Bible says if we love the world, the, far, the love of the Father is not in us. And so in the courtyard of Christianity today, there is corruption, there is compromise, there is complacency, but the Lord wants us to know this morning that there is also a remnant. A remnant of people that God has reserved 
in these last days. A people who are willing, whatever the cost, to live their lives to glorify the Son of God. The question to all of us this morning is, do we want to be a part of that remnant? Do we want to be a part of what God is doing and what God wants to accomplish in the earth today? For those of us this morning who are saying yes to ourselves, what we are indeed saying is that we are acknowledging the fact that we are saying yes to the cross. We are saying yes to the dying of ourselves in order for Jesus to be lifted up. Jesus said in verse 32 of our text, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. If he is lifted up, not if self is lifted up. Not, if, not, not self and man's pride and ego is lifted up. He says if he is lifted up, he will draw all men unto, unto himself. He was here referring to his crucifixion. But prophetically speaking, he is saying to us this morning, if I am lifted up in your life and if I am lifted up in my life, if I am honored, if I am exalted, if I am given the right to reign through you, he says, I will draw all men unto me. Not just Greeks, but drug addicts and prostitutes and sinners and our loved ones and our children and our unsaved spouses. And our unsaved parents, he says, I will draw all men unto me. But the condition is, if he is lifted up through us, are we willing this morning to yield ourselves to the Lord and be the people that God is calling us to be? It's nothing new. His purpose has been the same throughout the very foundations of the earth, that there will be a people that will reflect him, a people that will reveal who he is. And so the Lord has need of us. And people are in need of us. They need to see Jesus in all of us. God bless you. Let's all stand.
Precious Lord, we thank you so much today for speaking to our hearts concerning the things that you desire to do in these last days. In the days ensuing, Lord, you're bringing all things into alignment, both in our lives and in your church at large. And so we pray for the work of your spirit in the hearts of your people today. Those of us who have named your name. Those of us, Lord, who are called, who have been chosen, Lord, as a peculiar people in the earth. That we will truly reflect, reflect you, not just in word, but in deed. And so we lift our hearts, we lift our hands, O oh God, as an indication of our surrender and our willingness to yield to your revealed purpose and will for our lives. And we say, Lord, go deeper. Have your way in us. We desire, Lord, to yield. We desire to surrender. We desire, Lord, to apply your word in the areas, Lord, that we are weak. The areas that we are struggling, Lord. So that Jesus, so that you, Lord, will be glorified and seen and revealed to those around us. We commit our lives to you afresh. And we say, have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen and amen. Hallelujah. I'd like to speak to those of you this morning. I see we have a number of visitors with us. I know that some of you may be already saved. You may have given your life to the Lord. But for those of you who have not, I want to extend an invitation to you this morning. We said that Jesus is the hope of this world. He is the life. He is the way. He is the truth. The Bible says no man shall come to the Father but by Him. If you're looking for peace today, if you're looking for rest, if you're looking for this, the satisfying of your soul, there is an emptiness and a longing for something or for someone to satisfy that longing. I want to declare to you this morning that Jesus is the source of all that you will ever need. He is a living water, the well of living water that will never run dry. So if you're here this morning, you've never given your life to the Lord. You've never recalled a day and a time where you have made a profession to Him. Where you have opened the doors of your heart and invited Him into your life I'm giving you that opportunity this morning not to join a church not to join another religion but to be a part of him a part of the body of Christ here on earth so if you're here today and you want to give your life to the Lord just raise your hand high just lift your hand up high if you want to surrender your all if you want to give your life over to the Lord Turn your life over to Him. Now is the time. Anyone here this morning? Don't be ashamed. Don't be conscious. I was conscious. The first time I heard an invitation, I was afraid to move because I was the only person. But the Lord reached me. And the day came when I publicly made a confession of my heart and my life was never the same. So if you hear you're struggling, Jesus went to the cross in front of everybody for you and for me. Let's not be ashamed to say yes to him and to give our lives to him. If you, are you here this morning? Just raise your hand. Be bold. Be bold. Be bold. Yes, ma'am, I see your hand. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am, I see your hand. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Let's stand. Let's stand for him. Let's give our lives. Let's be courageous. Come on, raise your hand. If you want to accept Jesus. Come on, let's raise your hand. In Jesus' name. Father, thank you. Okay, let's just make one more step. One more step. One more. We're not going to embarrass you. I just want to lead you in a prayer, but I want to face you talk to you one on one just come forward just come to the front I'll meet you up front just lead you in a prayer of consecration
Anyone else? Anyone else? Just come forward. Hallelujah. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Just come forward. Anyone else? The altar is open. Jesus is waiting. Anyone else? And if you're in your seat, you're still shy, still intimidated, still in fear from coming forward, you can stay right where you are and say this prayer from your heart. Just repeat after me. I'm leading you in a prayer, but it must come from your heart to the Lord. It's a prayer of consecration, inviting Jesus into your life. Amen. So the Bible says, with the, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. There's a reason why we're asking you to pray out loud. Okay? Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you this morning recognizing your love for me. Recognizing that you went to the cross, laid your life down, paid the price for my sin so that I can receive salvation through you. I come to you this morning recognizing that I am a sinner. Recognizing I'm in need of a savior. Recognizing that I'm in need of your peace and your joy and your Holy Spirit. And so I invite you into my heart this morning to be my Lord and to be my Savior. I ask you to wash me. I ask you to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I promise to live for you from this day forward. From this day forward.
Well, if you didn't get it this morning, I don't know if you will ever get it again. But I'll tell you, if you how you can know if you get it. And it won't be too long from today. It might very well be today itself. You see, when somebody comes up against you, in disagreement with you, or oppose you, or do something that's wrong, you will know if you got it. But just in the event that you didn't get all of it, and you slip, remember, Jesus is still there to forgive, to cleanse, and to restore. All we have to do is to run to Him. Run to Him. It's not going to happen all at once. It's, he's a loving God. He's gentle. The Holy Spirit is very, very gentle. He will get you there as long as you want to get there. Once you purpose in your heart and you make some strides, He's going to help you. He's a wonderful God. Will you bless this morning? Okay, God bless you. You may be seated.